Not really enthused with the Romaic ruminations thing. You want to change the name of the show? I'm thinking more Greek gropings. Oh, no. No, no, because Greek, because it's Greek rather than Romaic, and groping, you know, grabbing the thing by its nub and really getting down to business. They're Greek e- gropings, it's more of a hands-on approach. <laughs> We're back, Dean. Are we? In well, many ways, we never left. <laughs> it's like we're a glutton for punishment, honestly. But uh, you know what? I've heard some pretty good things from people with regards to the show that we basically did. Obviously, they have no test or critical faculties. No taste whatsoever, I don't think. No. Absolutely none. So, uh, first thing is... Uh, even though you already used the word once, I am going to make sure that I don't use that word again. What word's that? Contrafibularities. I'm not saying that word, Dean. Okay. Come on, say it with me. Contrafibularities. You know you love it. Contrafibularities. So you did it. You did it. Didn't oh, hurt too much. Oh, sorry. You know what annoys me? Um, how people, some people pronounce nuclear as nuclear. Or how people say Australia. Instead of Australia. Australia. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Brits, and especially if the, uh, the proper upper RP, they tend to really emphasise the or bit, I find. Or picture instead of picture. <laughs> I remember that in the oldest. Going to the pictures? Yeah, as, as opposed to the cinemas or, or what have you. Right, so uh, we're going to be doing, um, you know, if you want to sit down, we thought we'll pick a few things up to actually... Uh, uh, start the program off with. Before we do that, just on a point of clarification, yes. as we were recording, and I don't know if the recording captured this, you said the word G. So I'm wondering whether this program is actually brought to you by the letter G. <laughs> because I don't like G. I prefer yeah. F. Okay. Spelled PH, like I said last show. Oh, right, all right. So, so, so are we doing this? Is the show brought by letters and numbers, or do we leave that out because there are no sponsors? Well, well, not yet, but would sponsorship matter based on you know well, it's a, how we bring about it the goes what to the heart use? of the integrity of the show. If, for example, integrity, sponsor, yeah, if the sponsor <laughs> wants to have this segment or whatever segment brought to you by the letter Z, do we acquiesce to that just because we're getting filthy lucre? Mm. Well, it depends how much integrity we basically have. Oh, mine's for sale any time. <laughs> if you want to find out how much, just uh, send us uh, an email and uh, we'll let you know. I'm not even going to look in that direction because I won't even <laughs> grant a dignity of a response to those who would sponsor me. I'm not looking at you. Well, tough luck. Show must go on. Let's get on with the show. Okay. So... We're going to split things up um, uh, pretty much along the same lines. We do have your Facebook frolic, so uh, thanks for actually keeping that uh, oh, going. Oh, that's another thing. Yes. I'm not really enthused with the Romaic ruminations thing. You want to change the name of the show? I'm thinking more Greek gropings. Oh, no. No, no, because Greek, because it's Greek rather than Romaic, and groping, you know, grabbing the thing by its nub and really getting down to business. There Greek is. gropings, it's more of a hands-on approach. <laughs> and what's this rumination stuff? Well, there is just something... Greek gropings. There's something somewhat cerebral about ruminations. Greek groping sounds a little gutter-like. That's my point. My point is it's hands-on. It's something you can wrap your fingers around. <laughs> there is. So there's a lot of symbolism in what you're proposing, Should Dean. we discuss that after the show? Uh, you know what? Let's discuss it. After the show, can we have a phone poll, or do you didn't invest in enough facilities? No, for that to no, I'm afraid, no, I can't yeah, do any phone typical, polls. Typical, yeah, typical. yeah, I'm, but maybe you can do a, 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 a straw fake, poll, a straw poll, maybe a Facebook thing. I don't know. I think they do some polls on Facebook. You know, I'll, I'll figure, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'll figure happen. it out. Okay, 
All right. So a um, few things I want to discuss. One is uh, your um, – there's one, two, three, four, five. Five items here from Facebook that tickled my fancy that I want to actually bring up so with you. So you've just ruined the suspense. So <laughs> now people know that there are five <laughs> items. It could have been four. Could have been two. Could, could have been, been ten. Seven. Now I want, I want to be able to actually give people fair warning. It's good because the suspense was killing me anyway. <laughs> now I feel relieved. Well, you just keep on posting stuff, mate. I don't do it for the purpose of the show. Well, you know, it's fascinating stuff. People, like, people are interested. So they say. Yeah. Well, so you, know. you say. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting. Uh, now, the other thing I thought we'll introduce is uh, I hate using this. We we'll have to come up with something. Uh, fun for this too, but it's like an on this day thing whereby we can actually start looking at um, interesting facts and in Greek history. And you want it to be an alliteration? <laughs> Calendar concatenations? <laughs> yeah. um, okay, that might work. Let's work on that. Uh, and But I thought that what we might do too is we might actually um, focus on one or maybe one or two dates with regards to the Greek war of independence okay uh just for the sake of um 200 years of 200 years of freedom and absolutely. everything else good that's yeah that derives from that that's right so off uh let's start with the first one um oh yes okay let me bring this one up because unfortunately and where are we at? here we go all right let me drag this across over here Okay, so we're looking at this way. All okay, right. and three, two, one. We're back in the room. <laughs> so here we go. Oh now, God. what are we looking at oh here? God. Well, what are we looking at here? <laughs> well, we've got to describe it for those on the podcast. <laughs> My big fat grizzik, because, what? oh, how cute. They've made the E into a sigma to make it look more Greek. Yes. Idiot. The sigma is a different letter than an E. And if you're going to indulge in stereotypes, do you know no bounds? <laughs> that you must go and bastardize our beautiful alphabet, which we've given the entire Western uh, world as well. And then the words wedding plane, and then we've crossed out the two. And we've got a three because guess what? She's having another crack. Probably because one was puerile, two was excremental. The wow. one that was in between, which was, what was that one called? My... Life in Ruins, which I like to rename my time in ruins because after watching it in the cinemas, I wanted my life back. May we're really going to restart the show. I really quite. liked I really liked my life in ruins because the love interest is a Greek guy from Greece, so he's all like exotic and he's probably got a name like Spiros or Nikos. I can't remember what his name is. Right. But in the film he was called Poopy Kaka. His name was Mr. Poopy Kaka. That was his name. And I thought, how clever. And what a this is the apogee of Greek American satire. That you could name someone Poopy Kaka and expect that to be funny. And I thought, Vardalos, or rather Vandalos, because you are a vandal. <laughs> this is just great. I love this. Yeah. Fantastic stuff. Let's all get out the Windex and pretend that Windex cures everything because it bloody doesn't. We use Varekina in Australia. Okay. That gets rid of germs, not so Windex. So but, you know, Greek Americans are funny people, Pete. And you would have seen this. Um, I know Be I very careful. I've to... got many friends who are. No, no, I do too. I've got relatives who are Greek Americans. God bless them. God love them. We don't talk, but that's beside the point. <laughs> they love America. Yeah. And you go to America, so I'm told, because I've seen the photos, and you have all these very proud Greek Americans flying the American flag yeah. and the Greek flag on their lawn. Yeah. And it's all about, you know, the 25th of March and getting your Greek on and Opa and Oprah and all these things. Right. But they are uncritical lovers of America, which, as we know, is the great imperialist demon of our time. <laughs> oh, God. So I remember being in Greece and being with a bunch of Greek Americans at one of those conferences for Greeks abroad. Right, like okay, that. all right. And, see. you know, they're all very enthusiastic. Yeah. Australian Greeks are more laid back, more cynical, because you are really coloured by the land in which you live. Yes. And you adopt the attitudes, Totally agree with the that. Attitudes. Yes, 100% that, that's agree. that's what's brilliant about being yeah. Greek. There's all so many forms. Mm. And I'm thinking, what can I do to liven things up? There we and go. it was at the time of the uh, Iraqi invasion when uh, America invaded Iraq in 2003. Right. So I said to him, Gamot in America says Gamot. Oh, you, you, you said what? You can't see that. 
And like, you know, and your president is an evil man and he's a war criminal and he's creating untold misery throughout the world. He's my president. And, and how would you like it if I said that your prime minister was an yeah. evil shit? <laughs> and I said, but he is. <laughs> yeah, that's what and I, I hate him. And I was just looking at him and saying, you can't say that. I said, I can, I just did. Yeah, but I they, hate your president and I hate my prime I minister. Think, no, 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 you can't say that. You're a proud Australian. I'm like, what's that got to do with the fact that I hate your president who is an evil bastard? All right, all right. So there's a few things that I needed. Half dyslexic, <laughs> half entitled, but right. all bastard. <laughs> okay, so there's a couple of things I need to deconstruct here. Uh, one, uh, my experience with Greek Americans was actually quite different. Yeah, but you've been there, so you actually can speak with authority. I'm just talking out of my mouth. <laughs> so, but let me tell you, when I did go there, I was uh, I suffered under the same preconceptions. So, based on you know what I've seen on film or uh, Greek Americans, I might have met in Greece, uh, but. I'm, uh, when I've actually gone there, I was quite surprised. Um, first and foremost, the one person who I'm pretty close with, um, Gosta, who everyone calls Gas. Yeah, because Gastas. <laughs> that really makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> Listen, it works for them. Did and you meet John Stamos? No, I did not meet Well, then what was the point of that visit? Well, you know. I, Michael I, I, Dukakis? No, I'm afraid not. All right, fine. So yeah. you met some un- nondescript what guy I'm called saying, Gus. <laughs> Gus. And, and now you're an authority on Greek Americans, are you? Well, I think I am. I wouldn't call myself an authority, but I, you know, I'm just talking about my experiences okay, with them. Okay. So the very first thing is that, uh, um, yes, proud Americans. I wouldn't say overtly, though. So Gus hardly ever discusses it. And when I say him, I'm talking about Dimitri Morokiti is also a New Yorker. I'm also talking about their uh, their, their kids too. Are, are you name dropping? Because none of these <laughs> names mean anything to okay, me. Okay, all right. So the, the ones that I've basically well, met. How about you do this? Just replace it with John Stamos and Michael Dukakis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Jennifer Aniston. And maybe Aniston. Olympia Dukakis. Well, yeah, Jennifer Aniston. Now, that's an interesting point since you raised. You know, you see on Facebook all these memes. say like Greek women doing this or getting angry. And it's pictures of Jennifer Aniston. Right. And you question to the extent that Jennifer Aniston is Greek, feels Greek, partakes of Greek culture, but because she's a good-looking, successful lady in Hollywood, all of a sudden she epitomises what it is to be Greek. And I love that. Because you don't see any, bringing back to our chosen topic, because we've gone far off, (laughs) you don't see any memes, you don't really see too many memes of Nia Vardalos being portrayed as the epitome of Greek womanhood. No, no, no. no, Why? Because her films are excremental. (laughs) <laughs> because they make no sense. I don't, I'm not entirely sure, and I've never asked uh, any of my friends in, uh, in the States what they actually think of this film. I was not... Uh, so going back to them, let me just clearly clarify that. Uh, they can be very critical of um, their country and, their co- and the, the decisions that are made by their country when I was speaking to them. So there are, so there are many who are capable of that t- type of discourse. I don't go out of my way to antagonise them, though. Uh, and But every time I've raised a criticism, I was never really met with, oh, you can't say that. Oh, what are you doing insulting my country? Nothing like that. But um, Are you sure you're an American? You weren't in Canada? Because they're different up there. <laughs> Maybe you're just across the border and, and not known it. But the point is this. This lady creates puerile stereotypes which are outdated, irrelevant, and let's face it, not funny. You weren't a fan of the first film. Um, And I hate her for one reason, and one reason only, Mm -hmm. which is this. Every time, ever since the first movie, which, by the way, I fell asleep in the middle of. Right, okay. I was in Greece when I was watching it. In Greece, it's called Ramos Alelinica, and I fell asleep. All right. Because it was so boring. But every time I go to a Greek-Australian function, a yurti, a birthday, there's always some 50-year-old aunt or friend who will say, in a keki mori, in a keki mori, because it, that's that punchline from the film, the bunt cake, and she's saying, what's a bunt, what's a bunt? Uh, and then she says, in a keki mori. That's what I mean. I don't recall uh, exactly. that. Exactly, you don't recall. <laughs> I don't recall yeah. a lot about that film, to that's be honest. That's my point. If you don't recall it, it's not really worth watching. Yeah. Unless, the, uh, yeah. It's, it's a film which, to me, really says, okay, when you are dealing with your own culture... Yeah, and when you want to portray that culture outwards, right? To what extent do you then appeal to the stereotype conceptions that the others have, the mainstream has, in order to get mm-hmm. your message across? If indeed you have a message, which she doesn't, I believe. I mean, the premise of the first film that you know she's marrying a non-Greek, 
and it's the first time in the family and it's all confronting. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's not something that's so far relevant now. True. In the, uh, because it's a different age. Yeah. Everyone's gotten used to that. Yeah. We're in a different ball game. Absolutely, yeah. No one speaks Greek anymore anyway, so that's irrelevant. This war <laughs> well, I would say nobody. Culture. <laughs> well, generally they you don't. You do a good job. With um, your kids? Oh, I only speak Greek to myself. Who else would I speak? <laughs> Who else would have a conversation with <laughs> yeah, me? Right, okay. But the point is this. Outdated movie. Right. Um, having a crack for number three. Let's see if she gets something right. I'd be interested to see what. Because the first one's about her and her experience getting married to the non-Greek and all of the you know hijinks and hilarity that ensues. Yep. Number two is about dealing with her daughter growing up. Yada, yada, yada. What's number three? The grandkids? <laughs> Um, they're going to fight over Perusia. You know what? We are agog, and the G is spelt with G-H like Vincent van Gogh, uh, with anticipation. So, yeah, enough enough said. Now, you brought something else up there. No, but yeah. So, let me just flick over here. So, um, right, this, this lovely guy here. Yeah, so let me just flick Looking over very here. smug with his, uh, with his arms crossed. Right, and, so, uh, so, looking at us. so what are we looking at here? Who's, who, who is Okay, he? this is Kondrati Rilev. He right. was a uh, poet. In uh, Russia, right, around about the time of the revolution, mm -hmm. and one thing that we don't realize about the Greek Revolution is how influential it was in fanning other liberal movements and uh, pushes for democracy in countries like Russia, right. which was an autocracy and remained one until 1917. In which case, after that, it became a murderous uh, dictatorship. Rilev was what we call a decemvirist. There was a revolt in Russia in the 1826, mm -hmm. and that was all about allowing Russia to be ruled by the rule of law and not by the fiat of the Tsar. Right. So there was a revolt between the, with the officer class, and he was killed uh, in that revolt. He was a very, very passionate supporter of Greek independence. So we have some of his poems that he's written to uh, famous Russian heroes like Yermolov, right. who also supported, he was a general who supported the independence of Greece. Mm -hmm. He was fighting the Turks in the Caucasus, mm -hmm. trying to expand the Russian border southwards. And uh, Rilev wrote him a poem in, I think it was 1822, begging him to get involved in the Greek independence movement, bring his troops to Greece in order to fight. Begging the Tsar. There. Yeah, well, no, asking Yermolov, bring your troops there. And oh, the idea oh, was okay. for Yermolov to petition the Tsar to do so. Right. Now, Yermolov had recommended that the Tsar get involved, but the Tsar didn't want to do that. No. For many important reasons. Mm. One is he was ruling a multi-ethnic empire. He yeah. didn't want to encourage ethnic separatist movements within that. Yeah. Rilev and his like were thus envisaging a Greece that would be ruled by Liberal, a liberal constitution, full democracy, mm -hmm. and they wanted also to apply that to Russia. So for them, Greece was the prototype, and if that would be successful, they'd want that approach to Russian governance as well. Right. He was killed as a result of these ideas, and um, he died holding a book of Byron's poetry in his hands as he was being shot. Wow. Now, Byron, huge topic there, I suppose, as well, right? <laughs> so well... Let's leave Byron for another day because yeah. Byron is a massive topic. Yeah, that's what, But yeah. let's talk a bit about Pushkin, who was another poet who wrote extensively. And he's Russia's national poet. Right, okay. Uh, Casanova, no one's wife or daughter was safe. Really, they weren't. Wait, he Pushkin, was, was, Pushkin was Casanova was Pushkin's creation? No, he was a Casanova. Oh, he was a Casanova. Yeah. Okay. Was, sorry, he, he put the Pushy that. into Pushkin. And uh, <laughs> interestingly so enough, he worked for Kapodistrias who was the first governor of Greece. And so Pushkin got a cushy job through his connections in the mm -hmm. foreign ministry. Wow. Uh, Pushkin was one of two foreign ministers at the time, Nessel mm -hmm. Road, sorry, um, Nessel Road and Kapodistria, and mm -hmm. he worked at Kapodistria. And he was writing poems about the necessity of freeing Greece, and he was mm -hmm. also writing satirical poems about the Tsar and about the necessity, necessity of democratizing Russia. As a result, he was about to go to Siberia I in exile. Thought, and Kapodistria wrote a letter to the Tsar, which right. is still excellent. You can find it in the archives, which says, look, you know, he's a brilliant poet. He's fantastic. Mm. He means well. Mm. Cut him some slack. So he got exiled to Moldavia instead, where he was supposed to live with the governor of Moldavia's wife and husband, and he basically seduced his wife and had a great time. Yeah. But no, the Russians, and this is an overlooked part of the history of the revolution, mm -hmm. were very, very, very passionately supporting the cause of Greek independence, right? But the political situation did not allow the Tsar to transfer that into actual yeah. troops on the ground. Well, there was a whole thing about, you know, what happened in France as well, right? 
think you know this whole thing about uh, people causing revolt, killing the aristocracy. We don't talk about France on this program. <laughs> you know, oh, gee. Vive la France. <laughs> Liberté, égalité, Fabergé. Remember that commercial? Long time ago. No, I don't. Yeah. How did, um, how did uh, Contrati die? You haven't been paying attention, have you? Well, how did I just you told know? you. He got shot. He was executed. He, pl- he played a part in the revolt. I know, I've got the bit where he, uh, he was actually holding the book of Byron. Mm. Yeah, Byron's poems. What year, Do you remember what year? 1826. Oh, so a couple of years before, well, a fair few. A couple of years before you were born, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. A couple of years before the end of the revolution, I was about to say. But yeah, thanks for that. Okay. All right. So, um, got any of his works? Or did he live? Mm. No. No. Yeah. Just quotes. Just quotes, huh? Okay, well. I bet you do, though, at home. Um, yeah, sitting somewhere in next the suitcase. To the, next to the Pushkin and the Chuckle. <laughs> okay, all right, no problem. All right, all right, moving, uh, uh, moving on. Um, now, let's go to, to this particular wonderful-looking gentleman right here. Who's that? I don't know, isn't it? Um, I don't know who that is either. Or did we just put that there to pad out the program? No, it's uh, Lucas. Lucas Miller. Miller. That's it. Miller, <laughs> Lucas Miller. Mr. Why, is Lucas Miller. why is Lucas Miller relevant? Miller, Lucas Miller is relevant because we never ever focus on the kids of the revolution, what happened to them. And obviously kids are the most vulnerable of human beings. Mm-hmm. There's a war going on, mm. atrocities on all sides, what happens to the kids during the revolution? And they're left out of the national narrative. We don't talk about them. This is true. There aren't any studies. There's recently a book published about Mm. the revolution by a great scholar, Paschalis Kitromilidis. It's called A Dictionary of the Greek Revolution. It's split up into topics. There's a topic about women. Mm -hmm. There is no uh, separate chapter on kids. They're lumped in as an afterthought with the women. Now, many of these kids died of diseases. Disease was far the bigger killer of Greeks during the revolution than anything Gee. else. Because you have your various cholera. Yeah, plagues, never that, thought of that at yeah. all, to be honest. Um, you're getting people who are sick uh, in a town that's besieged. Mm. You're getting a restricted water supply, all these things, diseases abound. Mm. Now, Lucas Miltiadis was from Rumeli. Mm-hmm. He was from Livadia. And his father was killed during the uh, one of the wars there. His mother w- died soon after. He was an orphan. And an American Philhellene who was fighting on the side of the Greeks, Yeah, obviously, otherwise he wouldn't be a Philhellene. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's actually quite logical, yeah. Found him roaming around as an orphan right, and took him back to America. Adopted him as wow. a son. So I think Baltimore, I think they settled in Baltimore. Okay. So, Lucas Miltiadis became Lucas Miller. Mm -hmm. Lucas M. Miller, he kept the Miltiadis as a middle name. Right. And he studied law. He was a bit of a journalist. And he became a member of the U.S. Congress. So, he is the first Greek American to become a congressman. Wow. And not only was he a congressman, but he had conceived of a vision for America. Mm -hmm. So, he didn't want United the United States to be called the United States of America. Mm -hmm. He wanted to call, rename, and he actually uh, moved this in Congress Mm -hmm. as an official motion to rename the United States the United States of the world because his idea is that the whole world should federate into a world state where everyone belongs to the same entity but respecting each other's differences. So almost uh, the first proponent of globalisation? Well, I think that would have been Napoleon or Alexander the Great <laughs> or Genghis <laughs> Khan. Yeah, all right. Or yeah, yeah. the Persian You're King right. Darius. There were a few people that would have beaten him to it. But yes. he, yeah, yeah, he was okay. a visionary. I'll, I'll he was get, a visionary. I'll give you that and one. I would have thought that this is a guy that we would make a big song and dance about, but we don't. No, I never heard of him. And there are many other Greeks who are orphaned or enslaved, like Hios, 
the island was uh, attacked in 1822 right. by the Turks, sacked. Mm-hmm. Everyone either killed or sold into slavery. Right. A lot of those kids um, found their way into homes where they were actually cared for and not abused, although a lot of them were abused. Wow. And uh, one of them, whose surname ended up being Khaznadar, um, became the ruler of uh, Tunisia. Ruler of Tunisia. Ruler of Tunisia. This is this is a Greek orphan. Yeah. How becomes a Muslim? Obviously, um, he's because he's sold as a slave, right? And uh, enters the Sultan's army and ends up in Tunisia and takes over. <laughs> Just by being in the Sultan's army. Yeah. Being a gifted officer and uh, and having great administrative qualities. Wow. So it's when we talk about the Greek people. We always assume that the Greek people are either the ancient Greeks or the Byzantines, but we don't ever talk about the Greeks who became Muslim. No, this, doesn't, this doesn't tacit, fit the narrative. No, no, no. There's this tacit understanding that once you become Muslim, that's it, you're lost to us. But they did keep in contact with their families in many yeah. cases. Right. They did not lose their language, but right. they adapted to their circumstances. I suppose it's because we we tie uh, faith so strongly with our identity and our ethnicity. Which is great, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's something that's deeply felt within in person in each person in different ways. Mm-hmm. But I would argue that these people are also part of our narrative. Yeah, well, I can't argue with that. That's actually that's a very good point. So, anything else when, uh, about this particular gentleman that we should actually know about? Yeah, he should have gone to Specsavers. <laughs> Hey, listen. They were, I, I was, I've been told they were quite, uh, quite in fashion. That that type of sun, that type of, uh, yeah, spectacle wearing thing. Well, well, it's not a monocle though. You got to give them credit for that. Well, look. I mean, if we're going to start making spectacles of ourselves, <laughs> if you pardon the pun. Uh, how long did he? Do you know how long he served when he died? Anything like that? I think he died in 1904. 1904. Okay. And he only served uh, one term as a congressman. Right. Okay. All right. I should do some more reading on uh, on him. This is, uh, it seems pretty uh, pretty fascinating. Okay, so next um, item on the list I've got here is uh, I'm going to go to something uh, probably along the lines of um, that time, you know, War of Independence and okay. what have you. And I'm just going to hit this button over here now. Oh, now we can probably see it. So what are we looking at here, Dean? What does that look like to you? It looks like a, a, a I suppose, a, 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 a duffel, you know. It looks like a, a tombstone, but it seems to have Arabic writing on it. Yep, that's a tombstone. This is a tombstone of Cherkes Halil Effendi. Right. And he was the Sheikh of Islam. The Sheikh of Islam is the highest Islamic cleric in right. the Ottoman Empire. Right. So they are the ones who promulgate Islamic laws and then they're followed by everybody else within the empire. So He's the like the patriarch for the Orthodox. Right, okay, okay then. All right. So there was, a, there was that hierarchy within the Ottoman Empire at the time. It's, it's a complicated thing, but he's the chief cleric. Okay, all right. He's, all right. The, one, he's the one that is authorised by the Sultan to make proclamations. Mm-hmm. Now I'll bring you back to 1821 mm-hmm. and the revolution's just broken out. And the Sultan's not a happy chappy. No. Yeah. So what does he do? He uh, says to the Sheikh al Islam, well, you know what? This is beyond the pale. I can't have these people revolting. Mm. I want you to issue a fatwa. Mm. It's not fatwa. When you say fatwa, Arabs laugh. It's fatwa. Fatwa, okay. Uh, which is a law mm. saying that all pious Muslims must go and kill the Christians. Yeah. And we know that in Constantinople and in Smyrna, yeah, there were mass massacres of Greeks as a result of the revolution. Yeah, because the crowd was enraged; they yeah. were whipped up by the the Sultan. We're talking tens of thousands of people were killed yeah. as a result, mm. including one uh, Constantinos uh, Muruzis, a Fanariotti. Yes, you were talking to me yes, about I did. Yeah, I, I've got, I've got his name down as one. So of what the, what happens um, is they yeah. arrest all of these church leaders yeah. because the church was cons- was responsible for the Greek nation to the sultan. Yeah. And they arrest all these other prominent members mm. and holding them as hostages, but then the sultan loses patience and kills them. Now, the Sheikh al-Islam hears this 
And he's already speaking to Patriarch Gregory V about how to manage this situation. Mm-hmm. And Gregory V, the Patriarch, issues an anathema, anathematizing anyone who's revolting against the Sultan. Right. And he's doing this purely for reasons of safety, which is he's in the lion's den, he's mm-hmm. in the capital, he's where the army is, mm-hmm. and he's got a ve- very vulnerable group of Greeks in right. the vicinity, mm-hmm. and he needs to protect them. Mm-hmm. So he issues uh, an anathema saying, look, if you are um, fighting against your betters, you know, um, you're no longer part of this church. That's not good enough for the Sultan. So he's behind the scenes demanding action. Cherkes Halil Effendi is saying, look, I hear what you say, but I can't do this. Yeah. And the Sultan says, why? He says, even Islamic law states that if you are going to get me to order something like this, yeah. I can only ask people to go and punish wrongdoers and mm. not the innocent. Mm. So if you tell me that A, B, C, D, E, F, G are rebels and you name them, mm-hmm. I can then issue a fatwa saying these people are against uh, the law of Islam, yeah, yeah. all bets are off, mm. go boys, go. Mm. But if you're asking me to endorse the slaughter of innocent women, children, men who are not involved in this, well, that's against Islamic law and I'm not going to do it. So wow. the Sultan... They stood up against him. The Sultan said, well, it's you, sir. You're going to go into exile. In the process of exiling him... The Sultan exiled... The Sheikh al Islam, yeah. His chief cleric. Yeah. Well, wow. I mean, uh, Henry the the Eighth uh, got rid of Cardinal Wolsey, didn't he? Because <laughs> he wouldn't get his divorce for him. True, so it's kind true, of like true, that, yeah. and then Thomas More. Ah, yes. So these, th- there are precedents in the Western world. Mm. During the process of removing him for exile, the Sultan mm. ordered that he be tortured Jury, uh, for, uh, for exemplary reasons, to make an example of him. No one defies the Sultan. And during that process, uh, Cherkes Halil Effendi died. Wow. So, and then what happened was, there was a new Sheikh Ul Islam who was appointed. Mm-hmm. He authorized the slaughter. Of course, and there he was did. a mass slaughter. The patriarch was hung. Of course, he did. From the gate of the patriarchate, uh, tens of thousands of innocent people were killed in Zmirni, in uh, Constantinople and other areas of Asia Minor, mm-hmm. not to mention Cyprus yeah. as well. There was a big slaughter there. And the reason why we're raising this is because in our historical narrative, mm. there are the valiant freedom fighting Greeks mm-hmm. and there are evil Turks. But the history that we learn is is much more complex and nuanced. Yeah, we know that there were righteous people like the Sheikh Al Islam mm-hmm. who actually stood up to the Sultan and said, "Look, war's war, and we get all that, but we can't just be depraved and commit atrocities." And I'm not going to endorse that. And he paid for that with his life. And we don't know anything about him as Greeks. Yeah, you're we don't right. mention him. We yeah, don't discuss right. these people. Never heard of him, and we don't honor him. There should be a monument to this man. Well, that's actually saying something, isn't it? Uh, petitioning to get a monument for the leader of uh, the Islamic well, people of the well, Ottoman here Empire. Is, here is a, a holy man by their standards yep. who did not allow self-interest because he relied on the Sultan to keep his job right. to get in the way of his religious convictions. And his religious convictions told him that to authorise the slaughter of these innocent people was immoral and he wouldn't be part of it. And there are other situations of Muslims doing exactly the same thing. Warning the Christian neighbours, hiding the Christian neighbours, yes. tipping them off. Yes. Um, yeah. A lot of Muslim Albanians in the Peloponnese would tip off Greek freedom yeah. fighters and switch sides depending on how they were feeling that particular day. There was a lot of that. So the point is when you're discussing good, bad, friend, enemy, sometimes the lines are blurred. Yeah. And we've seen many examples of this. I mean, we're, just, we're talking about the... Greek War of Independence in that era, but you know, hundred years later, during the the genocide in Anatolia, same stories you hear. You know, um, Islamic families or Muslim families. Now helping. I know why this program is brought to us by the letter G. <laughs> Don't make it. Let's not go there. Uh, but you know what? As I was doing my research um, uh, and trying to get some interesting uh, dates for the uh, for the Greek War of Independence, 
I'm surprised at how many like dates there are and just massacres or massacre or massacre uh, beheadings beheadings and one of them was um this course in those uh so it uh it was even though we talk about that time and 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 uh, I haven't got the song in front of me but um not on the Cosiana. that's the oh that that yeah is it the one where the the man talks about living during that time yeah, things yeah. but the Fighting with Colocotroni and then sleeping yeah. with a good-looking woman uh, yeah. in his arms. And yeah, yeah. The truth was that it was really bad. Yeah. Most of them died of cholera. Yeah. Uh, it was brutish fighting, bad conditions. Colocotroni writes about how he had to lie to his troops all the time just to keep their spirits up, otherwise they'll just go off because yeah. they weren't fighting for patriotic reasons. It was for pay and conditions. Yeah. That was all it was. And it was a big task yeah. and a big ask, and they got there in the end. Um, in spite of themselves, mm. I just—I mean, uh, I'm not talking about glorifying, but uh, that song just—it—it it, it just t- totally—it's it kind of totally covers and and obfuscates the uh, the horrors of that time. Well, if you want, uh, to it, it even cheapens the uh, w- what those heroes went through by by singing about. Oh, if only I was there with them, and blah blah. blah. It doesn't it just doesn't sit right. It didn't never sat right with me. It's a nice tune though. Dionisio like Solomos, who we spoke about last time, mm. wrote Elefteri Poliorkimeni about the siege of Mesolongi. And that's all about death, right. destruction, desolation, and despair. Now, you, mm. would, you would expect this guy who wrote the hymn to liberty mm. to be writing about the glorious battles and onward boys and charge of the light brigade, mm. and, you know, all that mm. stuff. Mm. Kick mm. some goals, play on, play, yeah. you know, but he doesn't play do that, the does game. He? And it's all about the destruction, yeah. the hunger, yeah. the humanity reduced yeah. to penury and, pathetic, uh, and, and their pathetic uh, conditions yeah. and really emphasizing the horrors of war. So the song you're referring to, Dalara sings it. It's just a popular song. Yeah. Um, you want to really get a literary understanding of the horrors involved and yeah. the toll that these years took on the Greek people. Yeah. You read Solomos. Well, um, I think uh, then he was the most fitting person to write the um, the anthem um, for that reason. Uh, because there's no way you can really appreciate exactly what we have today Without understanding the the, the horror of what, of what uh, they went through and what sacrifices they went through in order to be able to free Greece from the Ottoman yoke, however, when you start glorifying things like that, it just for some reason just takes it it, it, it just t- takes the the ugliness away, and I don't think you can really do um, do justice to uh, our uh, ancestors. For what they sacrificed, if you if you do that, I think you just really really have to get into the nitty gritty and understand the the horrors um, of, of what they went through. And now, not just those heroes, as you said, that we talk about, but these unsung heroes too. These people here who were not on the same side, so to speak, yet uh, had sacrificed their lives in order to help protect um, the, the innocent. So yeah, Cherkes Halil Efendi, righteous Muslim. Mm. Uh, on behalf of us here at this Romaic Rumen Nations, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, yeah, and as you, yeah, as you said, uh, don't know not a lot on him, but uh, hopefully we can make that change. Change is as good as a holiday. Uh, right, so. Um, I've got one more Facebook frolic, but I'm going to leave that last. Oh, yeah, last. I'm Isn't that a last. tautology? You've only got one left and you're going to leave it last? <laughs> Doesn't that mean <laughs> yeah, the same no, thing? No, all right, yeah. But I'm not going to go through every single Facebook frolic. I've still got some other items here that I wanted to go through as well. Okay, and uh, uh, just, uh, oh, speaking of uh, 200 years, apparently 11th of uh, April, 1821, our first naval victory. Great. Yeah. Where was that? Uh, Milos. Kimolos. Milos? Yes. Is that near Mykonos? <laughs> or is that near Eos? <laughs> I don't know. Because the point is this. And there always is a point. <laughs> what I love about the naval history of Greece, and yes. you know, even today Greece has, I think, got one of the largest merchant shipping fleets in the world, mm. even today. Mm. Um, the 
country ruled by crisis, but we rule the waves. <laughs> Someone should tell the Brits that, I suppose. Oh, look. I, I love what happened afterwards when uh, Mjaulis, the uh, great naval uh, hero, was asked to, you know, the Greek state was set up. Right. Kapo Listrias was appointed mm. governor. Mm. And he said, okay, um, you need to bring the fleet into Port Nafplio and uh, hand it over to the official navy, which was being created. Mjaulis said, no. That's my f- ships. You didn't fight on the ships. We fought on the ships. Right. Bugger off. <laughs> and Kapolithria said, I'm the governor of this country and this mm. fleet belongs to this new country that we all belong to and right. can you please hand over the fleet because we need it for defence. Yeah. And Mjauli said, no. And then Mjauli sunk the fleet. He sunk the fleet? He sunk the fleet rather than hand it over to the Greek government. Oh, have we... <laughs> Have we not changed in 200 years? Then? <laughs> and I'm saying this is a great way of dealing with governments and property tax. <laughs> you know, land tax. If all of us burnt down our houses rather than pay land tax, that will teach Dan Andrews a lesson. Yeah, I suppose so. And anyone that comes after him too. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mjolis was onto something. Uh, by the way, we do not advocate burning your house down to avoid paying land tax. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, I've got something interesting here. 4th of April, 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Yeah, that was sad. Yeah. Uh, and what, but what um, came up very recently uh, was uh, how they honoured uh, the Orthodox priest who supported him during his um, Well, it wasn't marches. just the priest. It was the archbishop. It was the head of the Orthodox Church in America. Right, okay. And if you look at the photos of the Selma March, you know, the iconic Selma March where they all got together and they yeah, yeah. marched up the bridge, who's standing next to Martin Luther King? Archbishop Yakovus. Right. In the full hierarchical yeah. regalia, mm. uh, standing next to him and accompany him on this uh, historic march. And that's reproduced, and the reason why that's reproduced is so that uh, we can tell the world that, you know what, we're progressive, we're not racist, um, and the Greeks were really pioneers. And the fact of the matter is is that, yes, Archbishop Iakovos exercised a good deal of initiative and bravery in doing this because Archbishop Iakovos actually copped a lot of flack from his own people and a lot of abuse. You serious? From Greek Americans who were imbued with the racism of the uh, of the mainstream America and who could not understand why Archbishop Yakovos was doing this. And I'm talking about a lot of abuse, a lot of hate mail, and it went on for many years. But if you have a look at the pictures of that march, the only cleric that is marching by him, white cleric, is Archbishop Yakovos. Nobody else. And in an interview that he gave, well, they, you're going to bring up the yeah. I'm, I'm going to bring yeah, up the, the uh, I think the life yeah that if if if, if I can get it flickering, working, but that's okay. That's <laughs> okay. It's there, and he's standing next to the um, Martin Luther King. There, there he is, being yeah, very yeah, there we go. We very archdiocesan, yeah. arch hierarchical. There we go, and there he is by his side. Um, when asked why years later. He said, I know what it's like to be born into a country where I'm considered to be a second-class citizen by virtue of my birth or my faith. Because Archbishop Yakovos was born in Turkey. He was born on the Isle, I think, of Imvros. Right. uh, I did not know that. Which, after the Treaty of Lausanne, was given back to Turkey, even though everyone who lived on it was Greek. Uh, And then the Turks systematically went and made sure that the island was depopulated of Greeks. Of course. There are not many left. They come for pilgrimages in the summer. Right. But there aren't hardly any left. So he said... I know what it's like to live under this regime and there was no way I was not going to uh, express my solidarity mm. with someone fighting against that and no way why I would not participate in making uh, the country that I've adopted, America, a place where what I lived through Turkey doesn't happen again. That was a very brave and a very spirited and a very pioneering move. He was a man ahead of his time in, in many respects, a very influential man. Uh, we often argue, and I do, especially with my Greek-American 
friends in inverted commas because they only tolerate <laughs> me and we've been through that. We've just been through that, program. yeah. You would have um, made a we, few more. I, I do, and many Greeks complain about America's stance against Greece. But the fact of the matter is that such aid that we do get and such consideration that we do get mm. uh, can be attributed in uh, no small part to people like Archbishop Yakovos right. who could ascend the echelons of power to get what they needed for Greece, not only just for the Greek-American Greek community, but for Greece. Mm. He was a major player and who could also descend that to be close to the people who were considered by mainstream Americas on the bottom rungs of that ladder. So for me, this man is a hero. So yeah, it was an amazing thing. This day it basically came up um, and uh, as soon as I saw Martin Luther King and uh, the date of his assassination, uh, uh, this um, this religious man, and it comes into mind. Like yeah. it, 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 the first thing that pops into my head as a Greek is um, is is this Archbishop, and 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 what role he played during that time in uh, in trying to um, uh, validate. Not that need validate, but at the time, there was you know, Martin Luther King was going through more than validation, know. active support, active support, and collaboration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the movie Selma? No. In Selma, and this is the thing that gets me about Hollywood, is you guys mm. have got a prop department. And if you don't have costumes, call mm. the local branch of the Orthodox Archdiocese in, in America mm. and get a proper bishop's costume. They've got this weird stovepipe hat thing happening. It looks like they rolled a piece of cardboard around <laughs> someone's head and put a sheet <laughs> over it. It looks really bad. Really that bad. But they have not done Bishop Yakovus any justice. Right. But he is one of the few portrayals of an Orthodox hierarch in Hollywood. The other's in Fiddler on the Roof. This is Russian cleric. Right. That's something else. But yeah, he's. I, th I think he's the only Greek hierarch portrayed in a mainstream uh, Hollywood movie. Wow. Yeah. Just, that's, that's, that's an amazing fact. Uh, oh, going back a few years now. 6th of April. 6th of April. 1896. 1896. Do you want to tell us what happened then? First. Uh, day opening of the modern Olympic Games in no. Athens. No, 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 rubbish, rubbish. It this is what they want you to think. It didn't happen then. No, no, no. There was an opening of some games, but the actual Olympic Games, mm -hmm. the resuscitated Olympic Games, yes, took place twenty years earlier in Athens. I think in uh, eighteen sixty-seven or somewhere around there. Right. And okay. those games were sponsored by Ipirat merchants who were the Zapas brothers who built the Zapion, which is behind yes. the Marmaru Stadium. Yes. And the whole idea was they were the ones that conceived this idea, we want to resuscitate the ancient games, we want to do this, they built the stadium for that reason. Right. And the problem was that it was just for Greeks, which is what the original games were. Yeah. Absolutely. Why yeah, would you want right. to go and compete against other people <laughs> when you could just compete against yourself? <laughs> I blame the Romans. It was the Romans who said, we want purchase into this. You know that uh, yeah. Hellenophile and pedophile, uh, <laughs> Emperor Hadrian, <laughs> I want to be Greek too. And yeah, you want to be Greek. And then all of a sudden, all the Romans were Greek. And yeah. Nero uh, took part in the games and won mm. a chariot competition and all that stuff. Mm. But the games were for us. Right. It was a mark of being Greek. That's why one of the major arguments when people impugn the Hellenism of the Macedonians say, well, mm. these people got to take part in the games, which means they had to prove that they were, that they were part of the club. Yeah. Otherwise, you can't get in. Yeah. You, get stuck, you get left at the door through yeah. crowd control. <laughs> uh, and that's the point. So Zapas said, he left all this money. Let's have these games. The games took place. They mm. were a success. And that's mm. when uh, Pierre de Coubertin Yes. It didn't want to leave us to our own devices, wanted to make it international, wanted everyone else to join in. <laughs> why? <laughs> why? First well, of all... Why would you ruin such a good thing? First of all, do you know what that did to the medal tally? <laughs> yeah. It destroyed the medal tally. <laughs> you, we used to win 100% of all the medals. Yeah, that's it. Now, how many do we win? We're lucky if we get two or three. Man, yeah, absolutely. The, the, Who is the most high-ranking Greek gold medalist? Do you know? High ranking. Or high is it, ranking. Is in the one who's won the most? No, is in the one who is the highest in the social issue. Oh, well, I would imagine time. be some sort of king of Greece or yeah, something. Yeah, king yeah. Constantine. Yeah, ex king Constantine, mm -hmm. the last king of Greece before mm -hmm. he got turfed out. Yeah, uh, won a gold medal 
for rowing, rowing. No, for sailing, sailing in the okay. 1960 yeah. uh, Rome Olympics. Yeah, totally uh, thought it was um, equestrian for some reason. Maybe I'm getting him Sport confused. Of kings. I'm getting maybe him confused with uh, Prince, Prince of Charles Sand. and Polo. <laughs> yeah. and they love their horses. <laughs> but the point is that the 1896 games were a great success. Uh, attracted people mm. to the uh, most to most, Athens. Most participants were Greek, from memory. Yeah, but you know, Edwin Flack was there for Australia. Yes, and Edwin Flack yeah. won a gold medal for the, I think it was the Mar- I can't remember what he won. It was something, some race. I know was there a, was one Australian that won or something. something. Yeah. yeah, it was Edwin yeah. Flack, the first Olympionikis for Australia. And because Australia was a new country, they mm. didn't have the Australian anthem, so they played the Austrian anthem. At the award ceremony, <laughs> I did That's not know true. that. I that did, is true. I, I did not know that. So Greece gets opened up as a kind of modern country to the world. Mm-hmm. King George is there, the first benign, saying hello to all the other royals. Songs right. were written about it. Mm-hmm. Hollywood made a movie about it in the sixties. Calls it, it happened at the games or something like oh, that okay. with Jane Mansfield. That's a Never fun of movie of its time, which harkens back to that point because right. that was when being Greek was cool, and Hollywood would make films about being Greek. You know, mm-hmm. the boy and the dolphin. That one, a few others, when Nana Muskuri was yeah. playing a music and they were all singing along and everyone loved buzuki music. Yeah. Now the only person that likes uh, buzuki music is Mr. Pupikaka and Neil oh. <laughs> Yeah, you brought a full circle, haven't uh, you? <laughs> I have. Let's smash a couple of pates and say opera. Um, but oh, gee. It was sad because it almost followed the same trajectory as the Athens Games 100 years later because yeah. you have this triumph, all the focus on Greece, and a year after that, 1997, they fight an unsuccessful war against Turkey, almost lose uh, Thessalia and go bankrupt. So they declared bankruptcy in that year. Now, Greece, uh, 2004 Olympics, presenting the modern face of Greece. We made it just in time. You remember the Smith's Crisps ad that we all protested against where the Greek workers were portrayed as sitting on the asses, eating chips while the race was going on around an un unfinished track. I remember that ad at all. Yeah, no, that was a, an offensive look for ad, the ad. That our, our benign Australian friends uh, created on our behalf Fantastic. in order to portray us as uh, really workaholic people. Yeah. yeah. But anyway. Not because not in Australia, we didn't work hard at all. No, the, the no. term doll bludger was invented by someone else. But, <laughs> and you remember that the those games were famous for Saki Duva falling off the stage at the after show entertainment. I had no idea he fell off the stage. He fell off the stage uh, in full view of the adoring public. <laughs> and it was really a time where people thought Greece has come of age, Greece is in the modern world, mm. Greece is the best, and then four years later, yeah. crisis. Yeah, crisis. So it almost followed the same trajectory. Wow. But it was good while it lasted. Mm. There you go. Uh, okay. Now, uh, I'm going to go back to your Facebook frolic. Okay. All right. So let me just bring this up now. Come on, come on, come on. Oh. Here we go. He's, he, he, there he is, yeah. Larrabee, <laughs> who we remember from the Get Smart Show. Now, you and I would definitely remember this, right? Yeah. Um, and I would, I would be... Sh- Quite sure that those of our, that those who are older than us would remember him too. I don't know. Unless how. they've got dementia. Uh, yeah, unless they've got dementia. Because we are of that age. No, we're not. Speak for yourself. I'm not. I am speaking for myself. Yeah, yeah. I am not who of that you? age. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back to this. Mm. So, um, he's Greek. Is he? Apparently. Is that why he's on? The, yeah, he's Greek. Yeah. Uh, his name is Robert Carvelas. His father is Greek. Mm-hmm. So would you believe half Greek? <laughs> He's half Greek. His mother is, I think, Fre- uh, Irish. His father is Greek. And he's Maxwell Smart, the guy that, plays Ma- that played Maxwell Smart, Don Adams' first cousin, which is how he got the job. Because we do things the Greek way. <laughs> Don Adams' father was, I think, Irish. Mother was Jew. No, something like that. No. Father Jewish, mother Irish. Mm-hmm. There were two kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, Don Adams' brother was brought up as a Jew. He was mm. brought up as an Irish Catholic. I don't know oh, how that right. works. It would have been great dinner conversations, but beside the point, Don Adams' mum mm-hmm. and Robert Carvela's mum were sisters. Mm-hmm. Wow. So they're first cousins. He's, uh, he's half Greek. His father's Greek. He gets the job uh, because... Don Adams just thought, I'll put him in there, Don Volepso. Yeah, He's yeah. My, uh, my cousin. Yeah. But was good at the role, so he stayed on. Yeah, great. And Don Adams' first wife, Adelaide, mm. was also Greek. 
Hence right. the connection. There's, there you go. I did not yeah. know that either. No, there's, it's amazing how many Greeks mm. are behind, behind the scenes. Like F.W. de Klerk, you remember him? He was the president of South Africa yes. before Mandela. Yes. His wife's Greek. Right. Yeah. Uh, is it true that uh, our mutual friend John Rarakis was right with regards to Jaime? What did he say? No one ever pay, uh, pays attention to what Rarakis <laughs> says. You know what Rarakis was posted about? A comment, he posted a comment on your um, on your Facebook account saying that Jaime- I never read comments. <laughs> it's probably probably a good idea. He said that Jaime, uh, who played um, who's the, the robot. The, the robot, robot, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, is actually his first cousin. No. No. Jaime is actually a French extraction. Maybe the name, but I'm talking about the actual actor. No, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Um, oh, the, the actor. actor is a French extraction. Freaking, oh, okay, don't worry. Um, <laughs> Rirakis R- 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 is just a rerun of Rakis. <laughs> it's a rerakis. <laughs> so just don't pay attention. Maybe. Great food, great food there at the Philippines restaurant. But, that's a free plug, John. Uh, <laughs> I expect to be fed next time I'm down there, which will be soon because I love your food. See, John is great because you go there and you say he goes tithes not fast. That's what Ferro tithes. Yeah, and you say, well, you know, I don't really feel like eating this or that. Well, what do you suggest? Yeah, I'll bring and you a bit of this. And he bring you. I'll bring you a bit of that. Exactly what he he feels you should be eating. Yeah, that's right. And there's some honesty <laughs> in that. Um, and the great thing about Phil Lean's restaurant, this is the second uh, free dinner that you're gonna give us, John, <laughs> is the fact that it's real, authentic Greek food. It's not like, oh wow, dolmades, fresh out of a can, the way I love them. <laughs> no, let's get some dip out of the supermarket and yeah. serve it and charge exorbitant amounts yeah. and uh, burn some burn some meat and present that mm. as food. Mm. This is the real stuff. Yeah, That's yeah. why I love him. I'll, I'll That's lo- why I will forgive him his comments about Jaime. <laughs> as fake as they were. Because he feeds me. And no, that's all f- there is to be said about there. that. Food is very, very good there. I've, um, and he's, he's good company as well. Yeah, the company bit I'm not so sure about. <laughs> He's all right. You're good, John. You're good. You're all right. Okay. So uh, that was the last bit, but I almost forgot one thing. Okay. On Monday, uh, we attended um, an event. Was that the anniversary of the Battle of Troy? <laughs> that was when was that supposed to happen? Oh, Apparently, <laughs> because this this threw me when you were telling me about Troy. Yeah, it's a date that I found. It was it was on a website called On This Day. Yeah, and uh, and I was looking for some dates, some interesting things that were happening, and some website, you know, because yeah, that's why you really got to fact check a lot of the stuff that you basically read. Mm. Some website claimed that on on the twenty first of April, eleven seventy four, Troy was invaded by who? By the Greeks. No, no, no. I'm sorry. It was not an invasion. It was an op- It was a rescue operation. <laughs> oh, that's this right. is where you're feeding into the propaganda of the enemy. Yes, yeah, so you're because right. Because if you remember what happened, Paris came along and seduced Menelaos's wife. Yeah. And just, these things are not done. Took her to Troy and kept her there and wouldn't give her back. And that's your problem? Your problem with the, what I just told you right now is the fact that I called it an invasion. What about the date? Well, that's the date that the Hunda happened. 21st of April is when we co- when we commemorate the fact that the uh, Hunda uh, took took power in Greece, uh, suspended the constitution. In 1967, that was uh, on the 21st of yeah, April? and 21st of April, which is also my second daughter's birthday. Um, not 67, <laughs> otherwise she'd be older than me. <laughs> you but, timed that well. <laughs> oh, I didn't time it. It's also the day of her name day, so there's all these circumstances. But the fact that she was born on the day of the, in, the landing, the, the liberation of Troy... Yes, is a great thing. Now, who comes up with these dates? I don't know. I, I and why it. are these dates in any way important? You know what? It reminds me of, well, I think it was last year, they were celebrating the 2,500 years of the Battle of Thermopylae. Yeah. And had who Ger- cares? They had Jared Butler there. It happened two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, hang on. Um, we we, the, commem- we no, commemorate no, no. things all the do time. Do we commemorate the British, the, the uh, Roman invasion of Britain? I don't know. It's do so rem- no, it's so remote. It took place such a long time ago that who cares? Why is it important to celebrate the Battle of Thermopylae or the Battle of Marathon? It was important to the ancient Greeks because it happened around about their time. A lot of water has flown down the creek since then. Yeah, but there man, have been fifty million of these. Been many of us. No, no, no. It's to make a point, point. and the point is yeah, this: what's, they what's, want, to, they the want to marry ancient valor and the way that these things have been mythologized. 
with certain political, cultural needs now. And for me, it's drawing a longbow. It's like, as I say, the British celebrating um, Caractacus's or Boadicea's um, resistance against the Romans and somehow extrapolating from that that they're the same people doing the same things even now. And it's a long bow to draw. I thought everyone did. I thought everyone did. No, they didn't. We do that because we navel gaze and we think everyone else does what we do. (laughs) Oh, they don't? No. No. Well, well, we should go and 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 teach them then. It's lots of of fun. And you know that, I think it was in 1971, the Shah of Iran held at Persepolis. Yeah. Well, the ruins of Persepolis, thanks to us, because we burnt that place down when we conquered Iran. That's why we did too. Uh, that was one of the great yeah. things. That, you know, one of our mm. kicking goals for civilization. Yeah, right yeah, there. Yeah, um, yeah. He held this massive per- ancient Persian themed. He did. Do there to celebrate. Oh, the Shah, of course. Yeah, to yes, celebrate 2,000 like years yeah, of, yeah, the, yeah. of the Persian monarchy. Yeah. And that led to his downfall. And the whole world was commenting about how cheap, tacky, and irrelevant these kind of things are. So it's great that, I don't know, almost 50 years, well, 50 years after the, Tsar, the, uh, the Persian Shah has fall, fallen and done this thing and everything else happened there, that we're, we're following suit and uh, we're celebrating the uh, restitution of Troy and the Trojan horse. And, you know, Trojans are more known these days as tires and as viruses, but that's okay. <laughs> and if I was a Trojan, I'd be complaining at the stereotypization of my culture, but I'm not a Trojan. And no one really knows whether the Trojans at that time, if the battle did exist, were Greek or were Phrygians or what was going on because there have been so many layers discovered of that city. I think 12 layers. 12 versions of that city have been dug up. It's a very old city. Well, then, uh, you know what? I'm going to open another can of worms. Listen, I have read that they're not even sure whether... Uh, uh, what was his name? Spiro. No, no, no. The, the, the German who actually dug up Troy. Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann. Not, they're not even sure whether Schliemann actually found it or whether, or whether he cleared it and actually found an older city instead. Well, that, that's the point because Schliemann was an archaeologist, the man of his time. He was interested in finding artifacts to show off yeah. rather than undertaking a scientific study. Yeah, that's according right. To chronology and relating yeah. everything to its, its yeah. period. Yeah. And he did the same in Greece when he was doing Zanas Cafes in Mycenae. And he right. found that so-called gold mask of Agamemnon. Now, we got no idea whether that was Agamemnon's, yeah. or whether it was somebody else's or who it belonged yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, he, he, he it's just all part of the story, yeah. and you get to go to the museum, and it's much more easy for marketing purposes yeah. to know the name of the person you're looking at. I Otherwise, know. nondescript Greek, possibly Greek king, who we don't know what his name is. <laughs> yeah. no. no. Agamemnon. Yeah. That's it. Much better. But this is now. Now that was a very long tangent. But that's. But that was not what I was referring to. I was referring to an event we attended in Kualaru, uh on Monday night, and specifically the uh, New Year celebration event for the Assyrian people. Okay. So uh, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to talk um, a little bit about that because you've had a connection with the Assyrian people for a number of years now. See, I'm a member of the Assyrian community for my sins. <laughs> and therefore, that's what we do as Assyrians. We celebrate Chab Nisan, the first of the month of Nisan. Right. That's my car. <laughs> and you're being culturally insensitive now. Mate, I'm not being culturally the, insensitive. The Nisan Pintare is a very important part of our culture as Assyrians. <laughs> and you're making light of this. And I feel triggered. Uh, G. <laughs> Go on. Letter Z today. It's not G. No, Z. You're right. You're Thank right. You. It's Z. Zed. It's Zed. Zed for Nizam. Zed for Zod. <laughs> That's on a great film. The first one, not the one that came out. Yeah, so it was Assyrian New Year, mm. and the Assyrians of Melbourne had a function mm. uh, where they celebrated their New Year, and it was also close to their Easter because they've changed calendar. They used to celebrate Easter with us, and then they changed calendar, and now they celebrate Easter with the Western world, except for one group who were hold out and still yep. retain the old calendar. So they've got that new calendar, old calendar. Uh, split that we do Mm -hmm. and what's funny about Kuluru is that the church that we were at which is that's the hall of the church there yeah that's the hall yeah yeah uh, two two Ikopeda down is the old calendar church on exactly the same street that's really cool (laughs) it reminds me of a story that uh, Metropolitan Nathaniel of Chicago told me while he was here uh, last year Mm. and he was saying that in the around about the time of the First World War 
the Greek communities in America were split between Venezuelists and the Royalists because wow. the Royalists were neutral and they didn't want to enter the war and Venezuelos did. So yeah. when after Thessaloniki proclaimed his own government, there yes. was a schism. Yes. And that schism permeated through the diaspora and communities, especially in America. Gee, so there's a place that. in Chicago where there are two churches on the same street because one was built by Venezuelists and the other was built by Royalists. Mm. And now they're stuck with both of them and not enough people to go to either. So they're trying to figure out what to do, but it's a relic of that time. It still exists today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Metropolitan Nathaniel was telling me, and I thought that was a fantastic story. Wow. But that's got nothing to do with these uh, very buoyant uh, young people. They're an people amazing here. people, Dean. And there they are jumping. They're, they're quite a musical people, aren't they, Randolph, as, uh, as they said in Trading Places? <laughs> and there they are. There you are. And, uh, you're you're right there. Themselves. You're right there. Oh, we can probably just see a little Yeah, no, you don't want to see me because that's irrelevant. Actually, it's that's right. not me there. No, no, it's right. You're right behind the dancers. But the, right the there. point of this, because <laughs> I don't want to dwell too long on this, is this. Here's a people that have been through a lot. Yeah. Um, mm. Constantly subject to genocide. Yes. And constantly persecuted. Mm. And yet ISIS being the most recent one. Recent one. Mm. And very, very friendly towards Greeks. And very. what we don't know is that a lot mm. of them are fluent Greek speakers. They are. Because before they came here, I couldn't believe how many of them sojourned in Greece. Um, the running joke in my family is that the only person that has a Greek passport is my wife who's a Syrian, because she was given a refugee Greek passport as a stateless person to come right. to Australia. I don't have a Greek passport. And neither do I. Uh, my dad's entitled to one, but he hasn't got a current one. And the point is that, that they are very, very close to the, feel very, very close to Greeks. Mm. A lot of them speak Greek. Mm. One of their priests is a fluent Greek speaker for that reason. Yeah. And, um, yeah, a great community. No, absolutely fantastic community. And... Um uh, and it was a, it was great being there. It was great uh, associating with them. Uh, my personal experience was very simple. We spoke to our um, the illustrious uh, king of all the Syrians, Jacob Hawil, and I, rem I remember we wanted to do a performance at Antipodes, and we spoke to him, and I said, and he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, is Jacob sponsoring this show? <laughs> no, he doesn't have well, to. Well, then why do we have to mention Jacob <laughs> and the Antipodes first? Have to no, mention. Not mentioning any of that. <laughs> have to mention no, Jacob. Pete, not mentioning Jacob. <laughs> Jacob Howell is not going to be mentioned. <laughs> Jacob Howell's married a lovely Greek lady, yes. Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, and their son, the Honourable Joseph Howell, mayor of is the Hume. mayor of Hume. Yes. So he's the... Greco Assyrian mayor of Hume. Mm. We couldn't make it on our own. We had to have a bit of an Assyrian infusion there. Yeah. But I tell this man that the reason why he's great is because of his mother. And it's the Greek component <laughs> within. <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't really embraced that. Like he's, he, he's no, no, but it informs everything that he does. Right. Because he, he uses a very Greek approach to getting things done. Oh, he in does, does he? Sphere. And he's one of those few people that I admire mm. because his sole reason for putting himself up for office, which has put a hold on his career doing other things, yeah. is to serve his community. Yeah, yeah, he's, very, he's most a of huge community man. So enough said about the Assyrians. Um, mm. What else are we talking about? That's it. Oof, that's it. <laughs> We're, We're done. done. That's it. I just wanted to mention that because um, uh, it was a great uh, it was a great event and uh, I thoroughly um, enjoyed it and it was uh, just that's all. What's that? Lots of things. One is how I just tug the calodio uh, <laughs> out of the thing just by a short, sharp chopping motion, which is one of my favourite uh, ways of creating emphasis. Mm -hmm. But also, in terms of cross-culture, mm -hmm. it's something that we tend not to consider. What's that? Uh, the idea that there are cultures out there that have touched us in certain ways yeah. or are in parallel to us or have so many things in common with us mm. and we don't really celebrate or look into those um, an example in this year that I've been looking at the revolution in depth and really um, coming to grips, hence my wanting to call the thing uh, gr uh, Greek, Greek gropings. graspings and gropings, <laughs> yeah, is, is all these other cultures that were involved. And you take the Serbians. Mm -hmm. How many, first of all, the Serbian revolt took place before the Greek revolution. Yes, that's right. How many Greeks living in Serbia or migrated to Serbia mm -hmm. to help that cause? Yeah, And no the first idea. prime minister of Serbia was Greek. Had no idea of that either. Yeah. Um, when, when, who, and when? I think his name name was Naumichko, and uh, but he was he had to leave because his master Karajorje was killed by the Obrenovich clan because there were two major families Karajorjevic and the Obrenovich who were fighting for control of Serbia. Okay. 
and uh, they were basically dethroning each other and destabilizing each other for a very long time. And most of the Greeks were aligned with uh, Karagiorgi. So whenever Karagiorgi was on the outs mm-hmm. uh, and the Obrenoviches were in, it wasn't so good for the Greeks. Mm. But there's a Rigas Ferel Street in Belgrade because he was killed there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had no idea there was, a, there was a street there. Petar Naum, people like that, tradespeople, people who gave a lot of money, who used their diplomatic expertise to mm. secure Serbia's independence. We had a stake in that. Mm. And there were so many Serbians who came down and fought in the uh, Greek War of Independence, like uh, Vasos Mavro Mugnotis and a whole lot of other ones. Mm. Um, Jorgakis Olimbios mm. was uh, married to a Serbian lady whose first husband was one of the famed Khaiduks or Kleftes of Serbia. A lot of Bulgarians. Now, we tend to see Bulgarians in the official historiography as the enemy because of what happened afterwards with uh, true. the First yeah, World War, true, the Second true, true, World War, yeah. Balkan Wars, yeah. and everything else. Mm. But in that time, when this idea of uh, nation was still in its infancy, they were heavily invested in the liberation of Greece. And there were a lot of Bulgarians who came down to fight in the revolution. Really? And we ignore that. We ignore that. Right, I no idea. How many Italians, the Carbonari? Uh, the Carbonari was a movement which was designed to get rid of foreign rule in Italy. And so many Italian Philhellenes came and fought in Greece, not only during 1821, but in 1897 and, and even later. And the point is that when the revolution took place and when the Sultan just before that got an idea that the uh, Filikia Teria was a thing, yeah. he just thought it was a branch of the Carbonari. And a lot of European nations did as well so all these things are interconnected in ways that we would never know no and i think there's a lot of uh, joy in celebrating these things and maybe we should be reaching out to other communities to do that the serbian community uh, the russian community mm-hmm. no ipsilandis crossed yeah. the pruth river from russia yeah uh, his master wasn't very happy no but nonetheless that's what he did that's it uh, Kapodistrias was the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia. Yes. He also had a hand in drafting uh, Switzerland's constitution. Yes. Amazing guy. No, it was amazing. Uh, abs- absolutely amazing. And Kapodistria is the Istrian peninsula which is in shared between modern day Italy and Croatia. That's his original birthplace. Really? Yeah, when that was held by Venice. Not, not birthplace, place of ancestry, I should say. Place of ancestry, yes. So. Right. We have this very narrow conception of who we are as a people, mm. but the fact is that we're diverse. We are one, but we are many, and from all the lands of earth we come, as the <laughs> song goes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and why can't we celebrate this? There's no reason why we can't. I think we should. I totally agree. Um, you look at people like uh, my compatriot from Ipiros, Kazi Mikhailis Dalyanis, mm-hmm. no, who landed in Lebanon and tried to raise a revolution there. Yes. You mentioned that last uh, time. Uh, yes, you have mentioned uh, that there last were, time. There yeah. were people who landed in Dumyat in Egypt to try and f- fight there because of what Ibrahim was doing in Peloponnese. Wow. Ibrahim. And that's the funny thing. Ibrahim, was uh, his father was born in Kavala. He was an Albanian who was part of the Sultan's army, born in Kavala, mm-hmm. went to Egypt, uh, mm-hmm. found himself the head of a nation. And sent his son as a deal to uh, to the Peloponnese and to Crete to stamp out the Greek Revolution. It was actually quite successful until the uh, Western powers got involved by mistake mm. at the Battle of Navarino. Because uh, Britain had standing orders not to get involved. But uh, Kogriton, I think he was, he got in there and he, he took them on and, and defeated them. And that was the uh, that's what clinched it because we started fighting amongst ourselves, as we do. Yeah. We did that after the Persian Wars. You know, hooray, we got rid of the Persians. Now yeah. let's fight against ourselves and kill each other. Yeah. And bring the Persians to mediate. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, that was crazy. How many that. times when the Byzantine Empire was in peril through Arabs or Turks or Latins? Well, it was uh, Kandakuzinos, wasn't he, that actually aligned himself with Turkish tribes and brought them across Gallipoli and gave them Gallipoli in exchange for support to get rid of his rival in Constantinople. Now, that was smart. Yeah. Wow, I did not and, know that. And of course, we had the uh, this Tuepos uh, to Saranda where we beat the Italians, don't yeah. mention the war, and the Nazis, and then we had the civil war. Yeah. The after effects of which are felt still today. To this day. Yeah. I've got a very good friend of mine who uh, did a doco on his grandfather, and um, and a part of the documentary was talking about his experience during that, that time, that civil war. 
and uh, he was there, and he was being told off by many of the oldies in the village. They don't open up old wounds. Yeah, no, they don't talk about it. No, I know this in the experience that I've had talking to people about that time. They will behind your back, so behind their other people's back, say, "Oh, you know, after secret leaders, after blah blah blah." Yeah, yeah. But th- they don't want. They just want to let that go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's best that we just draw a line, and say, "You know what? That was bad." And move yeah, on. And just move on. But the point is this. Yeah. Coming back to what we were saying before, mm-hmm. we didn't do it alone. We no. had help. Yeah, we did. We need to appreciate that. Yeah, celebrate that because yeah. that's the strength. Uh, if you make it relevant by appealing to other people's understanding that this is something which is important mm. on a world historical level. Yeah. If all you're going to do is make it Greco-centric, no one cares. Yeah, you're right. Because no one really cares about us. Yeah. The us that they care about is the idealised Western Periclean us. Yes. And that's a stereotype. Yes. And it doesn't necessarily accord with reality. Mm. How do you get give people a stake in the revolution? You present it as their accomplishment as much as our own. And I think we're generous enough to be able to do that. Yeah, it's I think actually we true. Are. It's I actually true. It's not distorting the facts. Yeah, and, I, and it's not one of our greatest strengths, I'm afraid. But I think that it should become one, especially if we actually hope to propagate and and push. And yeah, it's culture. great for government funding for multicultural entities. <laughs> it is. It is. I don't know, man. The, the the evidence I've seen does not really show that. To be honest, I see. No, no, what you need to do is you need to go to these people to get grants. Yeah, and you need to figure out the wording that they use. Yeah, multiculturalism, inclusiveness, uh, gender equality, oh. which is very important, by the way. I'm not knocking that. Um, yeah, all these things you put them in there, recast it as the Greek Revolution. A- and look spoken at that to way. so That's many people who apply and. The language they use, so I asked them, they get, they get funding, and I asked, how? And then, Peter, you've got to make sure you know what boxes to tick. So would be sponsors, if you would have us uh, <laughs> not having to apply for funding and instead being able to speak in our own language, in our own way, using our own superior and superlative diction, please give generously. The number will appear at your screen tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Right, so... Um, uh, like we've uh, said before, we've got no outro. Still? No, no, we still haven't figured it out yet. Why don't we have an outro? I don't know. We, just, we never discuss. We always discuss uh, what we're going to talk about. Then I might surprise you with two or three things. And then after that, we just... Um, How about Pai Me Hypno Caterina, that old song? Do you remember Pai Me Hypno Caterina? No idea. I could find it. Pai Me Hypno Caterina, mm-hmm. because I am a little bit older than you. Mm-hmm. Remember when I was growing up? Mm-hmm. Whenever we would leave a choro, or it was late, we were at someone's house, right. someone would turn to their wife and go, Pai me ya hypno Katerina, and everyone would laugh. Ho, 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 ho. Because that was funny in the 80s. Why was that funny? Is it clearly it's a song? A, it is a song, Pai me ya hypno Katerina. Yeah. Um, some of you may remember it. I remember it. It's seared into the memory banks. All right. So maybe something like that. Okay. So, so I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll uh, close the show now, and uh, very shortly, very shortly, uh, for our audience's listening pleasure, we'll play a rendition of what's it called again? Do you know what? I'm just insulted. Just go. <laughs> just go. <laughs> just go. <laughs> Hopefully, it's not copyrighted. <laughs> we can actually play it without it being. I hope they sue you. <laughs> you know any good lawyers? No. <laughs> Neither do I. Don't get me started on those <laughs> bastards. Uh, all right. Well, until next time, mate. Of <laughs> Edison. Πάλι κι απόψε πίναμε και πίναμε και στην ταβέρνα μόνοι απομείναμε τα όνειρά μας σαν τα κάρβουνα σβηστά και η ζωή μας ένα πέλαγο μπροστά και η ζωή μα σε ένα πελάγο μπροστά. Πάμε για ύπνο, Κατερίνα. Πάμε να 
αλλάξουμε ζωή Να δούμε όνειρα από κοινά Που τελειώνουν το πρωί Πάμε για ύπνο Κατερίνα Σαν και μα κατηγορήσαν. Δέκα φορέ, δέκα φορέ μα χωρίσαν. Κι αν σε λατρεύω τώρα, κι αν με αγαπά, όνειρα είναι πια τα όνειρα για μα. Όνειρα είναι πια τα όνειρα για μας Πάμε για ύπνο Κατερίνα Πάμε να αλλάξουμε ζωή Να δούμε όνειρα από κοινά Που τελειώ Κατερίνα, 